just the tone. The spirit of the letter is just very refreshing. And it's one of those letters that it just, it, it has the frankness, which is, to me, most akin today uh, between the difference between a um, uh, informal letter and a text. Now, I'm not a texter so much, but I do have see the value in texting somewhat. 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 <laughs> somewhat see the value in texting. <laughs> and texting's this way for me. Uh, it's it's like many forms of communication, which on a on a technical level I completely disagree with, but I see that other people value them, so they're they have value because that's just the way it is. It's like Facebook. I disagree with Facebook. On a personal level, removing myself as a son, husband, friend, and pastor. If I weren't any of those things, I wouldn't have Facebook. I don't see any need for it. Now, I've been amused by it. I, uh, I <laughs> On social media, I just see funny stuff that uh, cracks me. Sometimes it's not intended to be funny, but it's funny. And, you know, I, I see the value in it. But honestly, I'm on Facebook because we have a, first of all, we have a church web page. I, I read an article last week where 44% of people have deleted Facebook on their phones. Is that right? Or is it 14%? No, it, it's a pretty high percentage. Like a lot of people have taken Facebook off of their phones. Now there are another... 14. Would be high. Is it 14? I don't know, but 14 would be high. It's a lot. Whatever it is, it's a lot. It could be, it's got, the number's got a four in it. I read an article about it. It's got a four in it. I think it's 44. But uh, I could be wrong. You know, Google it. Get on the Google. And uh, <laughs> occasionally, you know, you could use the Google to find out things like that. Uh, anyway. Uh, but they're down. A lot of people have deleted Facebook. And, and I read the article. I thought I'd like to delete it too. Matter of fact, I have many times, except I haven't closed my account. Out. Now, I've deactivated my account countless times. You may notice, like as your friend, I vanish sometimes for a little while and then reappear. And I just say, just, I, you know, this is just too annoying. I, and I, I've deactivated it. But don't delete it because we have our church's official Facebook page. And I think if I delete it, it might delete it. It might mess up our church's Facebook account. Or might just leave it you know, in the hands of Tony Colella. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. You know, Tac Cat might do something, you know, where, you know, I, I'm not there to monitor. As a pastor, I have Facebook because it is a form of communication. It's a way that people do connect with me to some degree. And so I have it because I'm a pastor. As a uh, sibling and uh, as a family member, I have Facebook because in some ways it's the only way that, you know, people can see our lives a little bit and we can see their lives. Um, but really, that's more for ladies, I think, than men. Um, I'll look at a picture if everybody's looking at it. But, you know, I, I like getting pictures. I, you know, I'm just not as picture. I'm, I'm not at that stage in life where I want to see pictures all the time. So I delete it except for that. And um, some other things. There, there's some profit in it, I suppose. Anthony, what are you looking at? You teasing Miss Angela? You don't mess her up. You make it so she can't concentrate. You're sorry, ain't you? No, not really. Okay. Well, I don't like getting you, buddy. Sorry. Uh, anyway, so I delete it, except that because I'm pastor, I got to watch the stuff you guys do so I can call you up and say you shouldn't have done that. So that's, there's a little bit of that aspect to it, too. And I'm watching you, watching all of you. If you say something or you do something, I know what you said or did. And so, anyway. That's why I've got all my fake Facebook accounts, and I'm your fake Facebook friend. We, you know, catfish. yeah, yeah, catfish Taj. So it's on Instagram, and Snapchat, Snapchat, we're not catfish Taj, yeah. but uh, Snapchat, Snapchat. <laughs> that would now that's an app. I'd go for Snapchat. Like that's not Snapchat. Snapchat. <laughs> that sounds like a restaurant, man. All right. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a form of communication and it's real. Text are the same way. And uh, the thing, I, I'll tell you, I do like an aspect of texting. The thing I like about texting is the terseness. Uh, people don't usually get mad if you don't instantly reply to a text. Or if you say, okay, 
It's my favorite text reply. Okay. My mom will say, how are you, my son? I miss you today. Thinking about you. Hope you're having a good day. Praying for such and so. Be sure to give me a call when you can. Not and I say, okay. You can do that in a text. My mom doesn't like that in a text. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, with texting, instead of saying, hello, how are you today? And all the, you know, the politeness in a conversation, you can just take it out. You just don't do much. There's just it's just mostly content. It's usually the message, but it's not all the flowery extra language. And so texting I guess is that, right? Is am I right about texting? Text people? Sure. Texting is terse. And that's what it's intended to be, just a quick textual message. But it's and it's different than email. I don't understand the difference in email. Matter of fact, some of us old people, some of us forties and older, we text using email. We, I mean, we'll, we'll just send a quick message, fire it off in an email instead of using text. I like that. And so, anyway, but uh, I see First Timothy and really Paul's relationship with Timothy sort of like almost a texting relationship. They, there, are some, there are some vagaries, some politenesses that are in the letter. But it actually, it's pretty direct. Like, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Almost like, almost like a boss texting an employee on a company phone. You know, that's the way I sort of see the tone of First Timothy. It's like a boss that says, you know, don't neglect the gift that's in you by the putting on of hands, and do this and this and this, and tell this person, and you know, whatever. It's, there, there are a lot of because of the relationship that Paul and Timothy have. There isn't a I hope it won't offend you if I ask you to, you know, they just cut out the hope it won't offend you part of the conversation. So I don't care if it offends you or not. You're my son. you got to hear this. You know, just boom, give him the, the facts and the information. And we'll see that more, actually, uh, as, as the text unfolds. But this evening we uh, see some, uh, an, an un, or uh, the, the conjunction un accordingly or therefore uh, begins chapter 2. And... Uh, I exhort, therefore, uh, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now, I've heard, heard some fantastic messages, no sarcasm in this, some fantastic messages just explaining the meanings of the words, supplications, uh, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. All of those are related to uh, conversation with God. All those are, you know, directed to God. So I, when Paul exhorts, and he's given the church a practical command that is for their edification, supplications, pleadings, if you will, uh, prayers, requests, things that you're actually asking for, uh, intercessions, like uh, interceding on the behalf of, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Those are great applications, but actually, that's not the message here. In other words, the all men is actually the message. I exhort, therefore, that you do all these things for all men, because the list of individuals who are going to be covered that are the object of these type of conversations with God are not individuals that you would naturally think to intercede, supplicate, uh, pray, and request or give thanks for. These are, these are as uh, our failed presidential candidate of a former year would call deplorables. These are individuals that uh, Hillary Clinton would say, or Barack Obama would say, you know, are a bunch of middle class losers clutching uh, their their handguns, their Bibles, and clinging to their faith in God. You know, not really. Uh, these would be people that actually are godless. These would be people deplored by the deplorables in a context here tonight. And the truth of the matter is we probably don't agonize much over the wicked. 
or over those that are in authority and are tyrann tyrannical toward us, as the case is by the Apostle Paul in this epistle which he is writing from prison. How's that for a setting? Let's think about the setting for a minute, shall we? Who's ever present in Paul's mind on a day-to-day -day basis? Who's, who's in front of his face as far as people go? How do you know? Church. Nope, he's not in church. He's in prison. Who's Paul seeing on a continual daily basis? What? Lost people. Lost people. What kind of lost people? Uh, prisoners. Yeah, some prisoners, probably. But he, but he, but it seems as though he's maybe imprisoned in a in a in a house with a guard or keeper. Guard centurions. Yeah, government people. Maybe maybe he's even maybe maybe yeah. even Nero. Yeah, government people. Uh, he's, yeah, it's Roman Roman soldiers and government people. We have him in prison. Yes, ma'am. Let's go say that slave. Onesimus? Onesimus? Yeah, he might have been there at the time. Yeah, we know Onesiphorus had been there and refreshed him. You know? Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, he's hanging out with... In, he's involuntarily hanging out with okay. people in authority. And that brings a sense to the context, but it brings more than just a sense to the context, it brings a context to Paul's attitude in his circumstances. If you think about it, was he held because he wanted to be in prison? I mean, he was told by the Holy Spirit, you're going to jail, right? He knew he was going to prison. He knew he was going to Rome. The Holy Spirit had constrained him. He knew that. Does anybody enjoy imprisonment? No. Does anyone in imprisonment come to a place of strong appreciation of their guards? Isn't it kind of us against them in that kind of a situation? Isn't it? It's like you're on the guard team, I'm on the prisoner team. And that brings a context not only to Paul's maturity, but to his Christ-like spirit, doesn't it? So he said, Paul said, I, I exhort therefore, uh, this is in conclusion to what uh, Timothy is supposed to be doing, not neglecting the gift that's in him. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Then he goes through the laundry list for men, or for kings, and for all that are in authority. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. He has noted in the previous passage, as we focused on last week, how that most of the believers have turned away from him because of his chain, because of his imprisonment. And just keeping in mind everything, you, you would expect more of a surly, defiant attitude from Paul. Of course, you know all the guys in Ephesus don't like me anymore, uh, Timothy, except for, you know, that fellow Anesiphorus, and, and uh, what a blessing he is. He's refreshed me, and... These other guys. Now, in verse, sorry, I messed up. I'm, I'm in the wrong, uh, I'm in the wrong context. Okay, don't wonder everybody's grinning at me. Sure. I've studied the wrong context. That's that's what deals. I, I mess up sometimes. I just believe it all. Anyway. Keeping, keeping that in context, in, in chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul says, the people that you're to pray for are kings and for all that are in authority. And what are you to pray for? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. Right? 
So his response, his attitude toward his chain or toward his imprisonment in this context is pray for the people that are harassing you and causing you no manner of frustration and irritation. Now, do we have those people today? We have groups today, don't we? Of, of people that are just oppressive. Not in the sense of the Romans, but oppressive. And if we pray for them, we most likely pray for their removal. Really, I mean, that's what we want. God, get these people out. Get rid of them. They're frustrating. They're whatever. I don't think it's wrong to pray that we can have righteous rule. God has privileged us actually to be able to have that. Uh, but Paul's context here is pray that these individuals under authority would allow us to lead a quiet and peaceable life. And then he goes on to say, uh, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. How does God want you to live? What would God be happy to have you pray for? What's good and acceptable in the context here? What? Yeah, to, to pray for those that are in authority so that you can live a quiet and peaceful life. God does not forbid you to pray for His enemies. You know, I probably in life... Don't know with knowledge. There's there, you can always have somebody hate you and you don't know it. You know you have like the instead of a secret friend. You know they have they have those ladies like to do this when they have fellowships. They have like this secret sister or whatever, and they sneak around and buy gifts and do nice things for each other secretly. And that's fun. That's nice. How about secret enemy? <laughs> I have I have a, a pastor friend that had one. Uh, it it. Uh, the pastor would preach on the radio, and somebody would listen on the radio, and then he would sneak by the church at all hours and leave like long, handwritten, hateful notes, like about once a month. And he'd just leave a nasty, hateful note. And they figured out who it was, actually, eventually, but he had like a secret enemy. He didn't know who it was that hated him. I guess I kind of have one of those. Somebody glues on our window out here the anti-government note about every couple of months. I call the organization that they copy and paste and uh, let them know about it and they say that they're trying to figure out who it is and stop them, but they glue nasty anti-government messages about every few months on our window out here. And the thing about it I don't like is just vandalism. I just It just irks me. They're irritating. My secret enemy. I don't know who they are. I might know them. Is it one of you? <laughs> <I'm doing that. laughs> anyway, um, they use double-sided stick tape, like really good quality double-sided stick tape. It must be like 3M or something. And when you take it off, it, it messes up the window. You know, and it's just irritating. I'm like, why do you do this? Uh, <laughs> pray for them. Like, really pray for them. And the idea here is this is good and acceptable in sight of God our Savior. We'll have all men to be saved. And the conclusion here is if you were to understand the heart of God toward the person who hates you, really probably what they hate is God, isn't it? And what I was going to say is I don't knowingly have a, an all-out personal enemy, like somebody that hates me personally. Most people that hate me hate me theologically. Or they hate me because I'm a Christian. I mean, if they were to, to just say, this is why I hate you, they tell you, I hate you, I hate, Christian, I hate you, I hate Christians, I hate all Christians. It's not personal. You know, it's, it's a for the cause of Christ hatred. And to be truthful with you, it doesn't bother me that much to be hated by such. But it doesn't often occur to me to take God's attitude toward them, which is that He would have them to be saved. 
And there's just something sweet about that, isn't there? We sing that song, It's Just Like Jesus. Just like Jesus. We didn't sing that here. We sang it in Miami Beach, right? We sing that here? It was Miami Beach. We sang it in Miami Beach today. It's hard for me to remember what happened where. I don't know if you've been all the places. We sang it's just like Jesus. You know, it is just like Jesus to want to save people that are just hateful toward Him. Like Paul. And as I think of Paul along this juncture, I see him looking at the Roman soldier being like, yeah, I remember when I was just like you. He's looking at the unbelievers who are breathing out threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. And he's thinking, but for the grace of God, I do remember that. I do remember that in my life. And God saved me and He can save you. And he said, pray for these people because that's good and acceptable in the sight of God. Ask for good things to happen to them. God be good to that person. God, protect that person. Because I know you want to save them. And if you like them, well, why not? I do too. Learn to love unlovely people. It's a mark of maturity in the life of a Christian. To be able to, to, to have somebody just be mean and nasty and crude and rude to you and think, hey, you cute little devil. <laughs> you may not like me, but I can't help but like you. There's something likable about a gruff, cranky, cantankerous individual that God loves. Whether they're saved, whether they're lost, because God would have them to be saved. And so there's someone and they're in a wicked lifestyle or, or they're just anti-God and they hate you because you're not and they are intolerant. Wicked people are intolerant. They preach tolerance, but they're intolerant. Yeah, that's, that's the way of it. You can uh, be in a particular sin and you scream about the right to be tolerated and, and accepted but you won't tolerate somebody that thinks you're wrong, thinks it's wicked. Uh, but God loves you. God loves them. And the more like Jesus you become, the more you'll love people that are unlovely. Some people are just disgusting. They're mean. They're cantankerous. They're ornery. They're just downright ugly. God loves them enough for Jesus to die on the cross for them. Believers ought to be full of the same. I think of Paul in his chains in prison and he tells Timothy, love people. Pray for people. It's, what, it's, it's good and acceptable in the sight of God. Our Father who will have all men to be saved. Come in the knowledge of the truth. God wants them to be saved. Now what would it be like if the meanest, most cantankerous, nastiest politician in Fort Lauderdale, probably our mayor, what would it be like if he knew you and then he got saved years later? It'd be too bad if y'all had to have a didn't used to like you, but now I do conversation. Wouldn't it be better if you'd say, you know, I always loved you. I always wanted you to be saved. I'm so glad you are. Versus, man, before you were saved, you were just da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Huh? What's good and acceptable in the sight of God our, God our Christ our Savior? God our, God our Savior, our Savior Jesus. How's the how's scripture go? Huh? Been acceptable the sight of God our Savior. Yeah, God, God our Savior. Savior. All right. I thought Chuck got me there mixing up Jesus and Christ Jesus <laughs> there with it. You know. um, what, what would God like? What would Jesus do? Well, God would love them. And you know, it shouldn't be after they're lovely that we love them. It should be before they're lovely that we love them. And that's a pretty simple message this evening, actually, isn't it? And yet it is contrary to our fleshly nature. 
or at least to our current tendency. We tend to not love unlovely people. And we ought to. And so, it pleased God if you did. Father, I pray that you would help us to absorb the truth that's here this evening, Lord, and sometimes even, uh, in a, even inadvertently, you have a message for us, and I believe this is one of those that it's important for us to recognize and to, to practice. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.